Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to wherever you are, to whoever you are. Welcome to another session of the online lecture series that the Department of English, University of Gorbongo is organizing. As I was telling our speaker for the day, Shuna, Dr. Shunayani Bhattacharya, we here welcome not only wise heads of veteran speakers, but also fresh ideas from young scholars and teachers. We are all colleagues and we are all engaged in this common pursuit for academic excellence in these difficult times. So I must welcome our speaker for the day, Shunayani Bhattacharya. Uh, actually, her scholarship is in the juncture between, you know, comparative literature, post-colonial studies, and archival studies. And she is a scholar engaged in making sense of the birth of the reader, the uh, novel reader in Bengal in 19th century colonial Bengal, you know, to be precise. And today he, she has graciously spared her time from a busy schedule to talk Africa with us. The trope of darkness that has been very strategically built up by the imperialist project engaged in by the West, in which people like Haggard and Conrad were engaged. And today she is going to talk about the creating darkness in the works of people like Haggard and Conrad in such books as King Solomon's Might and The Heart of Darkness. But what is very impressive for us is that she wants to talk about how Bhivuti Bhushan Bandhavadha in Chandir Pahar, a Bengali novel that all of us have read in our childhood also. Uh, how Vibhuti Bhushan has used and usurped the trope of darkness. So without further ado, let me now welcome again Shunani Bhattacharya and hand over the reins of this session to her capable hands. Over to you, Shunani. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much for not just organizing this, but for such a kind introduction and sort of giving me the opportunity to speak to an August audience such as yourself and everyone here. So um, really my heartfelt thanks. And what I'm hoping to do here today, so you said I have about an hour. Um, I'm hoping to not sort of, you know, impose myself on everyone for that long. Um, but I really would like to kind of think through a few questions uh, relating to concepts of whiteness and sort of think about how that might um, both help us understand the British Imperial project, particularly in Africa, um, but also its reception slash reading history in, um, in Bengal. So my primary work, as Sir mentioned, is uh, on Bonkim and on the 19th century novel in particular. And so what really brought about part of this, this presentation today is um, as I was rereading Chadir Pahar not too long ago, um, I noticed this is really interesting scene. Um, this is sort of, you know, towards the end of the novel when um, the, if you know the story already, it is a story of adventure where there's this young man called Shankor who is, you know, who travels from Ojparaga or, you know, sort of the backwaters of Bengal to, uh, to Africa and not just you know, sort of Africa as a conglomerate, but to different parts of Africa, and he's kind of traveling through the continent. Um, but this is when he's in the uh, the uh, Reichsveld uh, forest slash mountain range 
and he's sitting and reading uh, Bonkin's Raj Shingo. And for me, there was that one moment of disjuncture, right? Because you're, you're reading something of a person reading something, and those are the moments that I try and sort of hone in on. And he talks about how when he's reading Raj Shingo, sitting in the heart of darkness, quite literally, um, he's thinking about how, um, you know, compared to everything that he's seeing around himself, he's met or sort of, you know, experienced Bunip already, the monstrous creature. Uh, he's experienced the African darkness. Um, how compared to that, the historical reality of Bunkim's world uh, becomes almost sort of chimerical, becomes almost, um, uh, what's the word for it? Sort of, you know, uh, unreal, so to speak. So that was the point that I really started thinking about. How does one then put this novel in conversation with what I consider to be two of its um, excuse me, two of its uh, sort of primary models. One is, of course, um, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and the other, and here I think it's closer to Chadir Pahar, um, this is Haggard's King Solomon's Minds. Um, and so sort of thinking through these three novels, my primary uh, problematic, if you will, is the construction, maintenance, anxieties surrounding whiteness and the appropriation slash tempering of that same category for the Bengali jubok or the Bengali youth as uh, Bibhuti Bhushan uh, sort of, you know, identifies Shankar as. So how does whiteness as a category sort of, you know, both become an amorphous thing that needs to be consolidated and defended for Conrad and Haggard and how then that category is taken up by someone like Bibhuti uh, Bhushan who's writing in the mid-1930s um, in uh, West Bengal. Um, and before I get further, I do also want to uh, sort of you know, provide one more caveat. I'm really looking at the genre rather than Bibhuti Bhushan as a novelist um, because, you know, we know that he's he's very sort of varied, so to speak. So I'm focusing particularly on this novel, right? So not necessarily thinking through the ideologies that span all of Bhikdushan's words, but just on um, Chandit Bahar. Um, so with that preamble, um, I would like to sort of, you know, divide my presentation up a little bit um, into four what I would call pillars that I... Um, sort of, you know, present as creating the darkness that uh, is sort of, you know, at the heart of Brit uh, British imperial expansion in Africa. Um, and these four pillars are the science of race, the scramble for Africa, the Berlin Conference, um, the history of British exploration in Africa, and the civilizing uh, mission. So these are the three, if we want to sort of, you know, visualize this in a 3D fashion. These are the four pillars that are holding up our house within which I am placing our three novelists. Um, and uh, I conclude by sort of, you know, leaving some questions up for you to think about how and where whiteness goes once it is uh, used in, this, in these particular ways by Bibhuti um, Bhushan. So some of this, uh, you know, might already be familiar with, uh, or you might be familiar with. So, you know, uh, thank you so much for bearing with me. But I think we do need a certain kind of historical grounding before we can go further into the more sort of conceptual questions. Um, and perhaps the history and the concepts are not that separated either. So let me begin with an anecdote. Um, the, you know, we are all really familiar with the controversies that are happening right now surrounding fair and lovely and then fair and handsome and how, you know, um, you know, fair has been dropped and it's all about lovely and so on and so forth. Um, the, the sort of history of this shade card is intimately connected to my presentation excuse me, my presentation today, because the card essentially first appears in the 1901 census, um, India census conducted by H.H. H. Risley and E.A. Gate. And like the ad, both Risley and Gate present the shade card as a scientific, objective method of measuring whiteness. Right. So the question is, how does this happen? Because prior to 1901, it's not as though you don't have censuses or you don't have, uh, you know, uh, individuals going into the field collecting uh, phenomenological data or uh, sort of, you know, physical data, so to speak. In fact, because you have that, that is why you need something that is objective 
excuse me, something as objective as the shade guard. So part of the way in which this this idea of what is white that is kind of you know floating about that to us today seems to be you know sort of very very firmly rooted uh, in European Enlightenment uh, in imperial um, ideology. The concept is actually fairly recent, right? Um, because it comes about with the consolidation of uh, what is known pop popularly, what is known uh, in the field as uh, the science of race. So during the 18th and the 19th centuries, and note, we are not really going too far back, right? Uh, again, this is not to say that the idea of race does not predate these uh, dates and times that I'm talking about, but that is a very different mode of talking about race, right? So race as we understand it, um, both not just in Conrad and Haggard, but as we understand it in the world that we live in today, um, sort of comes about through major European thinkers, such as Hegel, Kant, Blumenbach, Darwin, you know, they are all sort of working around the the idea that race can be seen as scientific. And so they create the hierarchy of races, white at the top, black at the bottom, uh, and everything else sort of, you know, in between somewhere there. And it's not a coincidence that those who are coming up with the science of race are also the founding figures of European philosophy, uh, European enlightenment, right? These two are very intimately connected. The, the science of race, along with the idea of the rational human being, who's sort of, you know, the core tenet of European uh, enlightenment, they are coming about at the same time. So, so why am I placing so much of an emphasis on, you know, race as scientific and so on and so forth? Because what it does is it takes a loose congregation of ideas, prejudices, unconnected facts, you know, things that could be hearsay, things that could be superstitious, and connects them so as to seem factually incontrovertible, right? You cannot question this any further, that this is fact. Science or race is scientific, you can measure it, it is factual, it is objective. And there's no room in the 1901 shade card for any sort of, you know, play in what one might understand about race and what the other might think about race. Because at this point, they're like, no, there are books, there are actual physical archives where all of this is being written down that give you scientific data. It's almost like, you know, when we start off by thinking about a certain uh, sort of, you know, physical fact and we don't necessarily know much about it, there are lots of myths surrounding it, and then gradually it becomes studied by science and then it becomes a scientific data or data set or fact that we can access, right? Same um, with the Copernican revolution. Similarly, you have, this is sort of, you know, the expansion of paradigms, um, scientific paradigms. So, the result is that race becomes something or moves from being something that is subjectively experienced to something that is biologically and bodily determined that you cannot escape. You are the race you are born into, right? Even if you go, say, for example, to something like um, Shakespeare's Moore, um, you will realize that even Othello, there's a sliding scale. We accept that he's more, he's a more, we accept that he's black, but there is something that is happening with the language that allows him to move. But by the time you come to someone like Marlowe, for Marlowe, there is no room to sort of, in fact, if there is room, then that is the side of anxiety, right? Because race is now fixed. Marlowe is white, Kurtz is white, Kurtz's mistress who's standing, sort of, you know, that magnificent woman at the end, uh, towards the end of the novel in Africa, she's decidedly black, right? There's no way one can mistake uh, one for the other. And Kurtz's problem is that, as far as Marlowe is concerned, is that Kurtz is actually pushing these, these boundaries that are now scientific, that they are now fixed. You can't push them. So the, the science of race, as you can well imagine, what it does is it constructs Africans as living outside humanity. So, you know, Kant very famously says that history happens in Europe the rest of the world has geography, which literally means that there is a temporal progression in Europe everywhere else just exists, right? The Everest just exists. There is no actual history happening there. But if you look at civilization, there is history there. So, you know, and, and there is there are numerous things that he talks about. This this if you sort of dive into it, it gets 
from bizarre to more bizarre, um, you know, because Kant has one theory where he says, essentially your color rises from your navel. It's at the center of your body. So the further south you go, the more the sun draws that color out of you. And there, there are all sorts of very, very strange things, what we would consider strange, but this is the science of the day, right? And this becomes a system of classification whereby Africans are seen not just as lethargic and somewhat capricious. Again, you'll note that I'm drawing on Conrad's terms, right? Um, but that is how they're racially seen, that they are not actually distinct. They're not individuals. You just have masses. You just have faces that are kind of, you know, languishing against the background. You are not able to distinguish it from the background, so to speak, right? Um, so if the African is animal-like, faceless, uh, an unindividuated mass, then the, the white man, the white race, has reserved for itself reason, reason that allows him to create history, reason that allows him to have agency. It's, so it's Marlowe who's going to the Congo. It's not the other way around. In fact, the very threat of the uh, inversion is kind of scary, right? Um, and so the European man, someone like Marlowe, someone like Alan Quartermain later on in Ryder Haggard, they have individual identity, they possess agency, they have will. And all of this is, you know, where the novels are drawing this from is something that would have been considered common sense, something that today we would sort of, you know, try and push back against. But for the late 19th century uh, Europeans, this was how the world was ordered. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's this huge sort of um, industry that grows up around the science of race. And that's what uh, Conrad is also pointing to when right before, if you remember, uh, right before Marlowe leaves for the Congo, he goes to the doctor who measures his skull and so on and so forth. So phrenology, measuring the size of one's nose, measuring the thickness of one's hair. Um, Marlowe is measured so as to see if and when he does come back, he can be re-measured to see what are the changes that are happening, right? And this doctor is not just um, a fictional figure. You have actual uh, physical individuals who are um, who are these who are these real doctors? In fact, uh, one of the more sort of you know hilarious side notes to this is that phrenology gets applied to help young women find um, husbands. So if you measure the skull of the man you're supposed to marry, if it looks a particular way, then he's a good man to marry. If he doesn't, then you probably want to stay away from him, right? So it's it, this this industry becomes more than just sort of identifying races. There is there is a certain kind of um, sort of popular currency to it as well. So if the first pillar then is the science of race, the second one, as I mentioned, is a scramble for Africa. And notice how each mo or, or each of these, what I'm calling pillars, what they're essentially doing is sort of creating the space that you can then very comfortably identify, objectify, look at from a quote unquote scientific perspective. And um, sort of see as the area of darkness, right? Apologies for the noise outside. Um, so the science of race then allows for the formalization of um, sort of imperial expansion in Africa. Africa is interesting compared to India or South Asia uh, in particular because Europe has its presence in Africa from pretty early in the 19th century, but it is only in 1884 that we have the formalization of European presence. So essentially what happens is that you have this sort of, you know, continent that is just seen as the dark continent, right? That anyone can go and claim whatever they want. And then, you know, Belgians find that they're stepping on the toes of Germans who find that they are somehow, you know, infringing on the rights of the French who are now sort of taking things from the English. So there's this kind of, you know, territory or turf war that's going on. Right. And so the European powers sit down in Berlin in 1884 um, and decide who gets what. Right. Africa is now divided formally into colonies by European nations. Um, and so the conference ensures it's in the interest, of course, of the Europeans who are ensuring that they can continue to extract resources without stepping on each other's toes. 
right? So France knows that this is my territory. Belgium knows this is my territory. Um, you know, Germany that's still not quite there knows that this is my territory, so on and so forth. So you will not necessarily go and impinge on another European's right. The Africans don't, don't matter in this, of course. Um, and the idea is that the heart of darkness can literally be divided, successfully divided by exter external powers, because this is empty, right? And, and this, is, this is the idea that they're all going in with, that the map is presenting you with uh, tabula rasa, that you can write on it anything that you wish. Um, two things of note are uh, agreed upon during the, the scramble for Africa or the Berlin conference. The first is that slavery is banned. Europeans say that slavery in Africa, within Africa, this is not the transatlantic slave trade, excuse me, although it is very much linked to it. Um, within Africa, any form of slavery is banned by the Europeans because they identify, and very correctly at this point, that the indigenous and Islamic powers are involved in slave trade, and this can very clearly pose a threat, right? Threat for resources, but also trade routes that would go through uh, different European um, sort of uh, colonies and you know, who has the right over there. So they just come down and say, no, Europe is civilized. We have already banned slavery at the start of the 19th century, right? Um, 1830s is when it is formally banned. Slavery is formally uh, banned. And so the agreement to ban indigenous uh, and Islamic-led slavery, for want of a better phrase, um, in effect negates any power that Islamic and indigenous rulers might have had and gives total control of goods and peoples to European nations. So that's the first interesting thing. The second is that there's a principle of effective occupation. And this is something that never happens in, uh, in Asia. But the Europeans say, we're only really interested in taking the sort of resources from Africa, right? Um, as long as the ruler of the territory has a treaty with us, the ruler can rule however they want, uh, but we need to get all of the resources. So see how sort of you know, ingenious this method is. They're, they're not, the European powers are not having to spend a penny in building infrastructure, in building schools, in, in doing all of the things that they have to do in India. Um, they have no responsibility whatsoever. They're simply there to siphon resources, right? Um, so they have total control over the land, but they have minimal expenses in maintaining it and furthering the idea that this is just this great expanse that one can just, you know, put one's vacuum cleaner in and suck out all the riches. That's all that is interesting there, right? Um, but... In order to then understand the scramble for Africa or the, the conference and how it comes about, we now have to move to our four, uh, third pillar, which is how do the Europeans even know that there are ores and goods and things to be had from, uh, from Africa? And, you know, again, this is probably a part of the story that most of us are familiar with, um, that explorations in East Africa are led by people like Richard Burton, uh, John Speak, D David Livingston, Cameron Baker, like Morton Stanley. You have names that are familiar to us, especially if you grew up reading something like Chandir Pahar. These are names that are sort of, you know, talismanic, that Livingston's diary, or, you know, like Burton and Speak, we're going to go out and conquer this place or explore. And interestingly, for the explorers, the word conquer is always secondary, right? They're going, again, in the interest of science. They're going in the interest of gathering knowledge. They're rational individuals who wish to learn more about the world. So this, this reason is feeding into sustaining the capital markets that then help sustain the racial idea, right? So they're all very, very intimately connected. Um, and the history of exploration starts around 1856, lasts for about 20, 25 years. Very unsurprisingly, once Africa is explored successfully, you suddenly have the Berlin Conference or the Scramble for Africa, and you have now discovered the hitherto unknown. Africa was unknown, Africa is now known. Once Africa is known, it's now been sort of you know, divided up into colonies. Um, and these explorations are what form the basis for novels such as Conrad's 
uh, Heart of Darkness for Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines and for Chandir Bahar because these explorations are often funded by larger companies, private companies, um, but they are always undertaken by these heroic leaders. You never hear of a whole team of explorers. You always hear of the one Burton or the one Speak or the one Livingston. Um, and so our hero, Shankar, is very much in line with this, this tradition of exploring, right? Um, and of course, they're all, all um, you know, starting with Marlowe all the way down to Alan Quartermain, Quartermain and certainly Shankar, um, very, very influenced by David Livingston, as you can probably imagine, right? Livingston has several, um, well, at least two recorded explorations into Southern and Central Africa. Um, and then he dies during his second exploratory trip. Um, and he writes up these detailed geographical and anthropological records and maps that then open the region up to the scramble for Africa, right? Um, so, my final pillar before hopefully I can, you know, sort of move into Chandir Bahar a little bit. Um, my final pillar is the civilizing mission. So, so far we have science in the form of race, capital in the form of the Berlin Conference and the history of explorations. And now the third and very, very important front is the civilizing mission. So even though Europe is essentially extracting resources without putting in anything at all, right? No responsibility, nothing whatsoever. There's still very much the veneer of the civilizing mission, which, you know, is, it, it, it sort of reaches its finest point in India, essentially. Um, but what this mission rests on kind of takes us back to the science of race, because it rests on the distinction between races as natural, inevitable, and insurmountable. That the white remains white, the black remains black, and the, you know, the black can never overtake the white, right? And it is the colonizer's parental responsibility to civilize and hum humanize the child like colonized. So you have the universal human, uh, which we still sort of, you know, use as the universal. And you know, I'd be very happy to talk about, talk more about that. But you have the universal human who has reason and using reason says that I am the racially superior individual and I am morally obligated to help those who are inferior to become better, but just up to here, right? So that they know how to recognize me as their superior, never to become, let them become so much, uh, you know, above their station such that they uh, append the hierarchy of races. So the civilizing mission, like I said, it reaches its finest points in, um, in and by finest, of course, you know, read a great degree of uh, sarcasm there, uh, reaches that height in, uh, in India, whereas most of Africa is sort of, you know, it, it's glossed over, so to speak, because most of Africa is seen as too far below even the human to sort of, you know, be brought, brought all the way up. And so even with someone like uh, Vibhuti Bhushan, you have the representation of the Maasai or the Somali coolies who are faceless, right? These are all individuals who simply blend into the background. And again, he's following his, uh, his predecessors, Conrad and Haggard, in doing that. So the, the way I wish to turn to the novels is twofold. Um, the first is that this construction of Africa as dark and Europe as a site of reason and white as good is not unproblematic, right? It's not something that's just happening and is sustained all the way through, but rather it is a site of anxiety because at all points you have to keep in mind that the Europeans are clearly aware that they're doing this construction, that they're having to build this thing up and send it out. So that is where I am putting the two together, Conrad and Haggard, because what I'm suggesting is that Conrad represents the anxiety 
surrounding whiteness. Whereas Haggard provides us with a way of sort of negating or combating that anxiety, right? And so the anxiety in Conrad manifests itself as, you know, as again, uh, this, is, this is probably very familiar to most of you. It manifests itself in the fear of contamination, right? where what would happen when Marlowe comes back from the Congo if Marlowe brings back a little bit of Africa with him, right? What happens when the, the dark taints and contaminates the white? So, uh, you know, you have this, this fear of, um, of Thames connecting to the Congo and taking the civilized to the ends of the world from which there is no real return, right? There's a solipsistic structure in, uh, in Marlowe's narrative that suggests the invasion of the home country by the colony, that suggests the invasion of England by Africa. Um, Marlowe sort of sees it as death skulking in the air and the water and the bush when he's talking about the Congo. But that the story is being told when they're all sitting on a boat in or on the Thames suggests that that death that was skulking is threatening to poison the Thames and England. That Kurtz's horror travels with Marlowe. Um, and that it does so is a sign that England can be vulnerable to the consequences of exploring the heart of darkness, right? If you look too far into the darkness, then the darkness can come and sort of, you know, take over you, so to speak. Um, and, you know, Conrad is far from being alone in this. One of the most sort of, you know, famous instances of this fear of contamination um, is to be found in something like Arthur Conan, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's Sign of the Four, where you literally have poison darts. Um, and um, even Wilkie Collins's, right, the Moonstone, where the Moonstone represents that taint that has come from the colony and is now threatening to sort of, you know, disrupt whiteness in, um, in England, like making people question as to what their uh, racial characteristics even might be. So you have Conrad really sort of perfecting this anxiety that sort of starts to manifest itself from around the middle of the 19th century. So by the time you get to um, the heart of darkness at the very end of the 19th century, 1899, um, you have this anxiety as a full-fledged sense in England. So if that's the threat to whiteness and to Europe, then we have a way of combating that if we look at uh, another Victorian text, Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines, which is, you know, the, the chronology here is a little bit uh, sort of skewed, I would say, because of course, uh, Conrad comes after Haggard. But I think if you think about it, it, think about this in terms of ideology, then it sort of helps put the two together better. Um, and so what Conrad, or, or sorry, what Haggard does is very straightforward, but incredibly effective. The first is that he addresses the text to all the big and little boys who read it. This is to be found in the advertisement uh, of, uh, to the novel. It is an adventure novel, right? So the genre can be allegorical and it can reflect Britain's emergence as a superpower, so on and so forth. Uh, and there are many sort of, you know, formulae that belong to this genre that then Bibuti Bouchon takes on which is, you know, it is a fairy tale or a quest narrative. You have a hero who goes on a quest. Uh, there are obstacles. He forms lasting bonds and he sort of overcomes these obstacles. But mostly he finds himself, right? The quest is for himself. Um, and so all of this happens in Haggard. Um, and in King Solomon's Mines, we have the really, really interesting thing happening where Africa is turned into a feminine entity, right? And in ways that one would consider fairly crude, but also one, it would be impossible to miss, right? Because you have the breasts of Sheba representing Africa and you have the masculine um, Europeans striding with their guns going through the, the breasts of Sheba into, uh, into the, uh, the land or uh, Kukuana land, right? So you have there, you have the beautiful Fulata and you have the ugly Gagul. So the ugliness and the fertile beauty, they both have to die, right? 
all of Africa needs to be buried into that little tomb-like uh, thing uh, when the door comes down and the men barely escape, but they manage to escape with the diamonds. It's always very interesting. Um, and so what King Solomon's Mines does is to contain this, this darkness, right? The darkness that threatens to spill from Africa into Europe, it contains the darkness by feminizing it and then killing it. So the men can then return to England with diamonds enough to make them wealthy for generations. And we hear no more of the troubling Kukuanas. No unexplained horror to bother Haggard's re readers, right? There's a very clean ending. So this sort of, you know, this, this, the, the best word is the Bengali Tanapurin, the, the sort of tension between the anxiety and the desire to contain that anxiety, to combat that anxiety, brings me to my final text for today, Bhivuti uh, Bhushan's Chader Pahar. And there are several very interesting things happening over here, right? The first, of course, as I mentioned uh, at the start of my talk, that it is a novel in which you find Bonkin Chandru sort of introduced at a very strange moment of all his novels, Raj Shingho. Um, but leaving those aside, something that, you know, struck me as I was reading this novel is that even though it's uh, even though the novel is published in 1937, it's actually set in 1909, and then uh, so the story starts in 1909, and then Shankar travels to Africa, and we assume that he spends six months to a year in Africa, maybe more. So we are now nearing 1910, 1911, and the starting point if we are to find one is when Diego Alvarez, the the Portuguese. Um, what's his name, the Portuguese explorer, the, the, the prospector, um, he starts off around the Cape Colony around about 1888, 1889. These are the dates we are given. And so if we look at the range, then we have the, the two things bookending the story. On the one hand, you have the scramble for Africa, 18, uh, 1884, you have, or 1894, and you have the, the sort of, you know, structure being set up, and you have the end of the Second Boer War in 1902. And you have, with these two events, you have the very firm control over Southern Africa uh, in particular, but Africa in general, by Europeans and by British for Southern Africa, right? Um, and so you have the, the sort of time frame being set for us. This is not really the height of, uh, exploration in Africa, right? If you if you'll recall, that's the middle of the 19th century. This is late 19th into the uh, early 20th century. But by shifting the time frame, what the text is doing for us is giving us a, a moment in African history that is now safely for the white Europeans, right? Most of the threats have been neutralized. Um, and so you have with sort of, you know, with our hero, the the point that I, I think I'm, I'm I'm sort of you know interested in exploring over here. So let's let's look at him a little bit, right? We begin with someone called Shankar, and the text identifies him as a shadharun she right? He's not a not a usual kind of uh, young man. Um, but we don't really get Shankar's first uh, last name until fairly late in the text, right? He's right, Jodhuri. But we really just get Shankar. So Shankar is this kind of, you know, stand in for all Bengali youth who want to imagine uh, themselves in, in, in his position in Africa, in exploring Africa, right? And Shankar is interesting because unlike most Bengalis, and again, I'm drawing really on... Um, sort of the, the construction of the Bangali Jat and Bangali Jati by someone like Bonkim, you know, following him, uh, someone like uh, Rabindranath to an extent, although they diverge. But really with, uh, with Shankar, you have someone who is this, uh, this incredible Bengali because he's not really, right? He's not a very good student, um, but he's someone who is very physically capable. Right? We are told that she hate by Munchput. She he can, you know, he can swim, he can climb trees, he is comfortable in uh, sort of you know forestish areas, not urban spaces, right? And very interestingly enough, he is very good at reading maps, which which you know will be quite a significant point as 
we find out later, you know, when he's without Alvarez, he's not, not even really learned how to read Alvarez's map. So now he has to sort of, you know, find his way through Southern Africa from wherever he is to Harare um, without a map. So, you know, even, if, even though he's very good at reading maps, somehow that skill is not with him at the end. But what he does have is this combination of both the Europe-inspired romance of Africa. He wants to go to Africa. The last thing he wants to do is stay and be a clerk at a jute mill, right, in Shamnagur. Um, he wants to go to Africa because that's where adventure is. And very first few pages, we hear of all of the British explorers who he wants to be like. Um, but alongside this Europe-inspired romance, you also have a vision that is distinctly Sanskritized and Perso-Arabic. So you have Africa as bloodthirsty and demonic, but those descriptions are not being drawn from European sources, but rather from the Arabian, uh, Arabian Nights tales. Um, and you have the sort of, you know, again, Raj Shingo, right? Which is giving us the other version of, uh, Im <clears throat> excuse me, of imagination. So Shankar is this sort of perfect, Enlightenment, enlightenment creature who can balance imagination and reason. But he does this in a quintessentially Bangali way. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And with Shankar, we have the, the hero who emerges as one of very few figures who have a name or, and a face, right? As I mentioned, the other two that we're really introduced to are Alvarez, uh, Diego Alvarez, who's the Portuguese explorer, and then the skeleton of the dead Italian prospector, Gatti. Um, and these three, and barring very few here and there, we don't really see faces. Like I said earlier, you, we see the, the, the coolies at, um, and again, I'm, he, in the spirit of generosity, I'm assuming that uh, Bibhuti Ushan is using it in a Bengali term rather than the derogatory uh, sense of the word. Um, but he's, we see these, uh, these sort of laborers, physical uh, manual laborers in the, the initial railway camp. And then later we see them again when the two are sort of, you know, traveling, Alvarez and Shankar are traveling through Africa. Um, and you have a tribe that comes up and Alvarez sort of, you know, just tricks them with canned food and cigarettes, right? And we realize that this is the worldview that Shankar aligns himself with, right? And we get this when you know, there are several sections of the text, but there's a very telling moment when Shankar considers Alvarez as, quote unquote, Shottikarer Manush Bote Adjon, right? He is identified as a real man, as a real person, but also as, as a thing and as an entity to be followed and emulated. Everybody else kind of melds into the background, right? So Alvarez's frame narrative, because we hear the story first of the diamond mines from Alvarez, Alvarez's frame narrative actually aligns Shankar with the racist prejudices, with the romantic representation of Africa, rather than separating the two. And so then the question becomes why, right? Why go through all this trouble to align Shankar with Alvarez, to align Shankar with Gatti, to create this monster, Bunip, who we never see? But if you really read, the, read through the descriptions of Bunip, the monster, it's very similar to how the literature of the day describes Africans as kind of like almost animal-like, but having a, this kind of near human presence. So Bunip is intelligent, Bunip is smart, but Bunip is also monstrous and we never see him, right? Or it, we don't really have a gender for Bunip. Um, and so with all of this, Africa becomes this kind of you know, mythic land of monsters and kafirs and uncivilized individuals and, you know, part human, part animal. Um, and Shankar travels the route that would have been traveled by, um, um, I'm sorry, Shankar and uh, Alvarez travel the, the sort of travel from uh, the travel to Southern uh, Africa, pardon me, uh, via the Belgian railway in Congo, Lake Tanganyika, the Veld in Rhodesia, today, what is today um, 
Zimbabwe, and this journey encapsulates the colonization of Central, Eastern, and Southern Africa. So at many points, we see the two of them, Shankor and Alvarez, sort of aligning or Shankar rather aligning himself with Alvarez, right? And so this is where I, I really sort of, you know, want to leave you with, or this is what I want to leave you with, which is that, so on the one hand, you have this, this very interesting kind of, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence. Shankar, in fact, does not come into conflict with the British because he's following in the footsteps of uh, a Portuguese um, Prospector, and then later on, he is following the directions of an Italian prospector. So he's still, you know, in line with the Europeans, but he's never really, you know, coming into conflict with the British or really, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, impinging on British territory, um, so to speak. But um, at the same time, you know, he, like I said, he travels the last bit without a map. And he sort of, you know, fated to kind of wander about a little bit. And so my my reading of this this novel and its conclusion is that Bhibhuti Bhushan is recreating whiteness for the Bengali reader, for the Bengali individual. And while this whiteness has all of the privileges uh, guaranteed it by its racial position, it is also one that can accommodate the Bengali because it is tempered with a sense of reason, imagination, and a great deal of fatedness that Shankar emerges because he's fated to do so. And he says that several times, um, right? If it is in my fate. And so he's still bringing civilization, but this is a softer civilization. It's tempered with wonder that is supposed to be innate to the Bengali sense. And Shankar's dreams of colonization are founded on tropes that are familiar to us, right? At the very end, he wants to end poverty. He wants to serve the people, but he wants to serve his own people, right? He wants to bring them out of the mundane and into the romance of Africa through the diamond mines. And so once again, you have Africa rendered a blank canvas. And like Marlowe, Shankar is etching onto it his story. He's literally becoming famous in Harare, uh, what he called Salisbury. Uh, by telling his story. So he's narrating what is the, the sort of, you know, mute Africa. Um, and the mundane and the boringly familiar Bengali countryside through Shankar will be reformed as Africa becomes not just conquerable, but imaginable. So I leave you with that and a colonial dream that recreates whiteness, but also question leads us to question what the position is of this whiteness. Thank you so much. Well, uh, we, we should all thank Shunayoni for such a wonderful presentation. The questions that she has raised need to be discussed and mulled over. So before I throw this session open for questions and comments, I would like to thank her again. And I take this opportunity, it's a very selfish choice on my part, to let you know about the next lecture that we are going to organize on the 10th this month. Professor Lisa Hopkins is going to be with us at 4.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time discussing Renaissance drama. So I would like to invite all of you to that session. Now, coming back to this, and if you are interested, most probably the link is there in the chat box, so you can get it from there. Now, so far as the questions for Shunoyani is concerned, uh, the, the questions will be there in the chat box, and uh, I would like you to ask questions in person. Yes, uh, okay, and yeah, there is uh, Dr. Shoipendra Banerjee, my colleague, who can moderate the questions for, for us. Yes, we, are, we have received uh, one or two, uh, couple of questions already. So, Shunoini, do I read those out to you? Um, sure, or uh, however you would like to, yes. Yeah, Pyle Roy is, Pyle Ray is asking how women are used to measure 
uh, this kind of whiteness and uh, enlighten about the gender issue in creating this whiteness blackness bias thank you so much pal that's that's a fabulous question and i think you know it's it's there's a long and complicated answer as you can probably well imagine but the shorthand to it that i would provide here is that the the original idea of whiteness does not necessarily include women and i realize that that sounds fairly controversial but let me explain a little bit because white is supposed to be something that is superior because it is rationally and morally um superior to the rest right so you have both the possession of reason and also a certain kind of moral high ground that the the white race can take now part of the reason why i say this excludes women is because women are seen again through the same um same sort of you know um uh, paradigm they're seen or framework as being both irrational and you know if you look at someone like virgin or not virginia wolf i'm sorry uh, mary wolstonecraft um as individuals who need to be seen as moral who need to be seen as virtuous right they're not automatically seen as such so whiteness as a category is is gendered masculine however the white woman is also very necessary for this categorization because the white man needs to defend the white woman both in order to prove his virility but also in order to ensure that whiteness is preserved as pure and is not contaminated right so the white woman is the site of anxiety in that she represents one of those weaker links right and that's what you have with um explored uh with uh you know sort of i'm thinking of funo right now at the top of my head but the there is there is sort of great work that is done on this but that would be my very sort of short response to you uh right thank you uh the next question is from nilanjana ghosh uh who is asking uh, how does the concept of recognition or so to say uh quote unquote unequal recognition serve to the issue of race alongside capitalism um if i am reading the question right then uh my my response here is that recognition is absolutely vital right the this is the sort of master slave dialectic whether you have it from hegel or later in manoni or in fano without the the african recognizing the european as superior without the kafir tribe recognizing the superiority or at least the intrinsic attraction of the canned food and the cigarettes you don't you don't have um the the racial dominance and if you don't have the racial dominance and theoretically you don't have capitalist expansion right um so recognition in that sense is absolutely necessary um recognition of superiority by the inferior race but also it works the other way right the the question of unequal recognition that the europeans or the british uh, at least in india see indians as recognizable so as to civilize them to a certain limit right see they certainly see the indian see us as as humans uh even though we are inferior um they certainly do not see africans as humans right they are seen as subhumans and even in india it's not a blanket term um so that misrecognition is very important in order to sustain then the civilizing mission in order to sustain the sort of justifications uh for amassing wealth um so i'm not sure if that was sort of you know adequately responds to your question or not but that would be my first shot at it uh yes nilanjan chakraborty is asking uh, about bibhuti bishon uh, bibhuti bishon never travel to america so how does that contribute you mean uh, africa uh, oh yeah of course uh, so how does that contribute to his imagination of africa which is conditioned by his own colonized identity that's uh, thank you and yeah this is this is the interesting part because um while both haggard and conrad did actually travel to africa 
um, most authors writing about the colonies never traveled there. Um, not Africa, not Asia, even parts of uh, the Americas, they never traveled there. But that didn't really hamper their storytelling um, processes because, you know, think about it this way. It's like they were writing all of these tales and what they needed in terms of fact, they could simply use the Wikipedia of the day for it. So there was enough literature on this um, that would have been available to someone like Bibhuti Bhushan um, that would be part of imagination in general, uh, sort of, you know, common sense imagination, so to speak, um, that he would never really have to actually travel there in order to write these novels. In fact, the beauty of some of these novels is that, uh, and I'm using a lot of the 19th century Victorians um, alongside with Bhushan to show that he's not only is he not alone, but he's, you know, in August uh, company that, you know, because they never traveled there, they could come up with pretty much whatever they wanted. So I'm thinking again of the Moonstone and the description that you have of um, the, the sort of, you know, many headed moon god from whose forehead the stone would have been taken. It's only when you haven't really traveled there. It's almost like Africa is the, the, the moon or Mars for 20th century science fiction writers. They, they don't really need to travel there um, in order to understand it. Um, as for conditioned by his own colonized identity, that's where I think, um, you know, that's, that's sort of where I'm going with the, the ending, where I think he cannot, he, he, he do, does not just appropriate whiteness, right? It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. He knows and sees himself as a colonized individual. And so he bypasses a lot of these direct moments of conflict, right? He's never showing shrunk or directly impinging on British territory, even though technically, uh, uh, Reichsfeld would have been part of British South Africa at that point. Um, so he's not showing him to coming into conflict with the British. Um, and also he's tempering the idea of whiteness, right? Introducing something that is intrinsically, supposedly intrinsically Bengali. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Nobunita Pal's question comes next. Uh, she, uh, she begins by congratulating you, mesmerizing session, ma'am. Uh, how do you problematize the friendship between Alvarez and uh, Shankar? I mean, Alvarez being an explorer from a colonizing nation and Shankar belonging to a colonized nation. So, yeah, that's it, basically. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's the sort of... The, there are possibilities, one which I am very interested in taking, in in trying to understand the relationship as more than just paternal, right? Because Shankar refers to Alvarez several times as almost Pitri Shoman or like his father. Um, I don't think it's quite that. I think there are sort of, you know, fairly obvious um, kind of attractions, if one might say so, not for the physical body, certainly, right? We are never presented with uh, Alvarez as someone who's physically attractive, but something, there is something about him that's attractive uh, to Shankur. Um, and then, of course, the fact that this is an unequal uh, friendship, right? Bibhuti Bhushan never suggests that Shankur learns and triumphs, Right. At all points, he needs to actually be rescued. Right. He he falls asleep under the the tree that's em, uh, emitting that um, that sort of almost sickly sweet smell, or that he's traveling through the the veld and he gets lost in the high tall grass. And so, at most points, he Shankar needs to be rescued by Alvarez. But at the end of it. Alvarez dies and Shankar survives, right? So that's the sort of ultimate triumph, if you will. Does he really learn from Alvarez? I would argue no. Um, does he pay homage to Alvarez? Absolutely, because he names the volcano after Alvarez. Um, and so it's this kind of like tension between the two of them in which Alvarez tries and fails by using European science. And Shankar survives pretty much because of guts and dumb luck, really. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the next the following questions are basically uh, outside Chandir Pahar, but, but I mean, just can I just chip in one question from my side as well, because Chandir Pahar has been one of our favorite uh, texts, as you know. Uh, yeah. So I was just wondering, I mean, just while you're speaking, uh, 
this how would you look at uh, shankar's relation with with indians as such there uh, tirumalappa for example uh, tirumalappa's death is a blow to shankar and mm -hmm. he is also reminded of home or desh uh, in a way so i mean uh, would you see that there's a prototype of the later diaspora and uh, his 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 you know location in africa in an alien land um, and memory working within him so i mean how would we really place these absolutely absolutely i think he's very much the prototypical uh, diasporic individual um but he's also i think a proto colonizer if one might say use that term for him um because while on the one hand he is deeply deeply nostalgic for bengal um he's also incredibly attracted to the african landscape and tirumalappa for me is actually one of those very interesting moments because he's you know there isn't really anything separating tirumalappa from shankar right they've both left home and hearth um i think tirumal has run away without really telling anyone at home shankar hasn't quite done that um but from then on you start to see a certain um for want of a better word i think corona captures it better than pity does but there is a certain sense of superiority that shankar assumes vis-a-vis -vis india vis-a-vis -vis bengal that you know bangladesh is or bengal is always represented as nostalgic but boring nostalgic but mundane uh nostalgic but poor right and so that's why at the very end he's you know sort of taking the money back in order to make sure that he can you know sort of help um so to speak help the poor uh and at all points that's that's what he wants to do he's philanthropic so i would argue that yeah absolutely he's he's a proto diasporic individual perhaps even a diasporic individual but he's certainly sort of you know tinged with colonial desires as well yes thank thank you very much yes um uh, i will skip two questions and go to shobud shobud sarkar is asking in response to the concept of whiteness uh he was curious to know your take on michael jackson's decision of changing color from black to white <laughs> so that, you would like to comment on that fascinating only only very briefly um i was you know part of that generation where everybody was a fan of michael jackson but i wasn't um i think it's race really works in a very interesting way in the US um very different i would say from how it does in the commonwealth countries or in the sort of you know uh ex colonies beyond that I, i really would not go so far as to say i have a comment on that except to say that the 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 sort of you know pathologization of that the the fact that you know so many people have argued about he had a skin condition hence he needed to sort of you know go to undergo that but did he really and how much excuse me how much of that whiteness was desired and how much of that whiteness was him leaving behind his blackness um yeah i i would be very very curious to know more about it but i'm <laughs> i don't know if i'm the right person yeah, it's fine it's fine yeah uh, so moving on to pile re pile re had asked this question about whiteness uh, debate uh is that why the white lady is presented as chaste and the black beloved of coots as voluptuous i mean is that uh, absolutely yeah yeah i'm thinking so next we move on to nilanjana ghosh uh, who very interestingly brings in uh, aronnok aronnok can aronnok be read alongside heart of darkness from uh, jungian psychology I and mean, from the perspective of jungian psychology uh yeah that's it basically and i'm not going into the other details um i i don't see why not i'm not very familiar with uh jung so i wouldn't really you know day uh, sort of <laughs> dare go there but i think with arunok you again have that fascination with the with with not just the non urban but with the forested and um you know again here this is a world that he would have been very familiar with right unlike africa he wouldn't have to really imagine what the forest would be like um and because the novel is so focused i think on the uh on the dichotomy between the the sort of you know the urban life and the forest life i i do believe that one would be able to read it as such um 
I would defer this question to someone who knows Jungian philosophy uh, and is, is kind of versed in that for that. But I think it would be a fascinating com- uh, comparison to make. Uh, yes, uh, just a minute. Uh, next is, uh, I think this is the last question. Pruma, Pruma Bhattacharya is asking, uh, how does the nationalistic identity of Shankar contribute to his urge to prove himself at par with the great European explorers? And is this nationalism unique to Shankar if, if we compare it with Haggard and Conrad? Um, he, yes, I think he's, there's this one, I'm thinking particularly of this one moment where, you know, they're climbing this uh, terribly high mountain, which is sort of six or 7,000 feet tall. Um, and Shankar says that he's incapable, he's virtually incapable of climbing such a mountain. And I don't know if any of you have done mountain climbing or not. It, <laughs> I was, um, I was doing a little bit of hiking a um, couple of weekends back and it's incredible. Just, just like, you know, walking up something that's steep and I, I wouldn't really do it if I was left to my own devices, but Shankar continues. He goes up and there is a moment when he says that he would never stop and bring shame on the, the Indian slash Bengali. I don't think he's quite differentiating there. Um, and, you know, and we could talk more about what, how problematic that might be, that eliding of Bengal for India. But he's very motivated by a, a feeling of national identity. Um, is this unique to Shankar compared to Haggard and Conrad? Um, it's not. Uh, it's very present in Conrad. Marlowe is very clear in identifying himself as British, as opposed to the Dutch colonists who are, you know, sort of, you know, who've, who've lost the plot, really. Um, and the other Europeans who are sort of lethargic and not industrial enough, but the British are really, really good. So he is very nationalistic as well. Um, in terms of Haggard, I'm trying to think about Quartermain. Yes, it is British. It's a British adventure tale. And Alan Quatermain is very much, you know, he self-identifies as British, even though he has um, other individuals um, in, in, his, in his sort of, you know, team, so to speak. Um, I, yeah, I would, I would say that that is something that's kind of intrinsic to the, the adventure genre, that you're not just doing it for yourself, but you're representing something bigger than you. Uh, can we take another question? One, one more. Sure. <clears throat> John, oh, Jointo Rana is asking. John Miller thinks hunting is about libidinal desire in the natural arena, natural within quotes. Mm-hmm. So, does that your comments yeah. on that? Um, I I do think that there is. I'm, I'm not sure whether. Uh, Bibhuti Bhushan is drawing on Miller or not, but there is very much the the desire that is, I would go so far as to say erotic um, in terms of how Africa is sometimes represented and Shankar's own relationship to, to that. Um, in terms of hunting in particular, um, Shankar isn't much of a hunter, right? He knows how to, he can. Um, is that part of the, of the, the sort of, you know, larger structure of it? My initial answer would be yes, because it is all, it's all of one piece, right? That he wishes to conquer the land by conquering the, the sort of animals by conquering the, or going on a successful hunt, so to speak, um, it does manifest that desire in him, except I'm also thinking about the initial moments of the hunt where all he's doing is really bringing the gun, right, uh, to the to the white man who's who's actually performing the uh, shooting. So I'm not entirely sure who desire it would represent, but I think that would be to, to say that Shankar isn't motivated by some form of a, a libidinal desire that, you know, sort of, culminates in this desire to possess the land, I think that would be the, a misreading of the novel to say that that's not there. So, yes. Uh, yeah, Shunana, thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of the questions. Uh, is is there any other question? Yeah. Amitda, yes. Yes, I think I think I, I need to butt in 
because I have something to add in answer to at least three of the questions that have been asked. Now I am I am especially targeting the question on the white women. Uh, another question was about recognition and the third question that I would like to add something on uh, is this 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 thing that Vivekananda uh, didn't go to Africa now I would I would like all of us to read another book by Hagar that is Alan and the Holy Flower uh, in Alan and the Holy Flower Again, the point that Shunani was trying to make that white women were the weaklings and they have to be rescued by white men, uh, not only to prove their virility, but also to preserve the, the purity of the white race, so to say. Now, in this, uh, in this particular text, if you read, uh, Dogita's wife and daughter, they had actually strayed and they were captured by an African tribe and they were treated as goddesses. And they were actually forced to stay in an island with the holy flower. And there was a chance that the daughter would be married off to the African chief. And Alan Quatermain, along with Dogita, Dogita is a white man who is called Dogita by the Africans. They actually rescue this, these women. And so far as recognition is concerned, again, I would especially refer you to this case of Dogita. You know, having recognized the arrival of Dogita, the white man, the entire attitude of the African tribe changes towards Alan and his retinue. So this, this text can really help us in answering the questions that were put to you. And so far as Vibhuti Bhushan not going to Africa, a lot, uh, later on, uh, when Buddhadev Guho had written Ruaha, he copiously praised um, Vibhuti Bhushan. He said, I am quoting from Ruaha, I, I, I have been to Africa thrice, and Vibhuti Bhushan had not been to Africa even once. But the representation of Africa, the description of the landscape and the flora and fauna, that Vibhuti Bhushan had come up with was really masterly. That was Uddhudev uh, Guho paying homage to Vibhuti Bhushan. So these are things that uh, caused my mind and that's why I shared this. Is there any other question? No, uh, so far no more questions. I think... Uh, so we, we, can, we can now wrap up the session. Yes. Well, uh, so far as my closing comments are concerned, again, I would like to thank Shunani Bhattacharya for not only giving us such a wonderful take on this issue, because she has not only talked about darkness and whiteness, she has also gone into the nitty gritties about the construction of both. So, thank you for that. And it was a very vibrant interactive session. And I must thank not only the persons who have come up with the questions, but also Shunani for giving such patient and erudite answers to most of them. Uh, I think with this, we come to the end of this session. I must thank Professor Nondini Bhattacharya, Professor Ashok Mahapatra, Dr. Dibbadduti Roy, and uh, other distinguished members of the audience for being here and having their own say. So with this, we again thank 
डॉक्टर सुनोयानी भट्टाचार्य एंड पार्ट हियर टू मेक अगेन ऑन द टेंथ थैंक यू Thank you so much. This was brilliant, and it was lovely meeting all of you. And thank you so much for organizing this. I, um, I hope I won't be able to attend the one on tenth because it'll be sort of past midnight around here. But I, I will look forward to the the one after that for sure. Of course, of course. We'll send you the links. Please do. I look forward to that. Thank you okay. so much. Take care. Take thank care. you very much, Sunaini, for thank being here. That was, that was brilliant as well. Thank you.